Good afternoon. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia today, the headquarters of ASHRAE for the 1996 winter meeting. And we're privileged to have one of our past presidential members with us today for an interview, Mr. Neil Patterson. Good afternoon, Neil. Good afternoon, Glad Pat. Glad to have you here. Nice to be here. Now, tell us about your pres. Well, I guess we won't jump right into your presidential year with ASHRAE. We'll start back with when you were born and then oh, lead boy. into it. That taxes my memory. <laughs> uh, 1929, during the Depression, out in a little town in South Dakota called Highmore, which nobody has ever heard of, I'm sure. I think when I was born, I raised the population of the city by 1%, something like that. But uh, lived there for about six years, I guess. Went to school on a train. My dad was a railroad man for about 50 years. So I rode the baggage car at school, learned to sort mail at the age of six. <laughs> Came home, my dad would take me off the train. Well, we moved then uh, from Highmore into the big city of Brookings, South Dakota, because I think they had one, a better educational system. My dad was very, very heavy into education for the kids. There were three of us, three, three sons. Uh, two of us were engineers, ultimately. The other one was in the electrical end of the business. But anyway, Dad moved to, uh, to Brookings when I was in the second grade, and we, we then progressed up through the high school, uh, participated in everything, I think, sports. We had state championship basketball teams, everything else, you know, and uh, went on to college because the college was located in Brookings, South Dakota, South Dakota State University at the time. So uh, that takes me up. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1947 and then graduated from South Dakota State University in 1951 in uh, mechanical engineering. And uh, from there, then I, one day after graduation, I was in the Air Force uh, as a commissioned officer. Did you go through ROTC program? Yes, went through the ROTC program uh, and uh, ended up uh, a year later in Korea for about a year as a, uh, an officer over there, ground equipment detachment commander over in um, Kunsan, Korea. Beautiful Kunsan by the sea, as we called it. But uh, interesting experience that I wouldn't have uh, given up for the world, to see a little bit of the world there. Uh, came back uh, from there and went to work immediately at uh, Wright Air Development Center. I just changed uniforms and became a, a power plant engineer on aircraft turbines uh, for about a year, Wright turbines, uh, which is very enlightening in terms of learning instrumentation, things like that, very delicate instrumentation which is heavy into the engineering area, testing, testing area. But it was there that I, uh, I met my wife in Dayton, Ohio. She was a uh, secretary to the... Uh, and that, that's Liz, right? Yeah, Liz, Elizabeth. Liz, she likes to be called. Uh, but uh, she was secretary to one of the vice presidents of National Cash Register. And uh, kind of the reason I met her was by accident. Uh, she uh, had a pass to the big park over in Dayton, which has the biggest swimming pool in the city and all the golf courses and the tennis courses. I wanted in there. <laughs> so it was a rather mercenary thing, but I met her and, and uh, we uh, got to running around together quite a bit. She took me home and said to her mother, look what followed me home, can I keep him? You know. And so we got married 41 years ago. 41 years? Yeah, I've yeah. been married for nice, 41 years. A nice time together you've had. Oh yeah, we've had a lovely time. And we have two young sons. I say young, they're much younger than I am. Our oldest boy is about 40 now. But he's in the business, he's in the air conditioning business, and he's in marketing and, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. He followed in Dad's footsteps for well, yes, the he did. HVAC. And in fact, he's very active in ASHRAE, I might well, add. Well, good. He's going to be a regional vice chairman next year. It will be a pleasure to From, work with uh, him. From Cincinnati Region 5, right. Mm -hmm. And my other son is also a graduate engineer, mechanical. Uh, he's in research up in Detroit, which is about four hours north of Cincinnati. And incidentally, we moved from Brookings then when I retired after 41 years with the train company in La Crosse in their headquarters operation. We moved to Cincinnati to be near our kids. And that was just recently just that recently you made a year that ago, move. Yes, yeah, we we're just settled in now. That's but uh, during the time uh, uh, that I worked for the train company, I had a lot of interesting experiences there, from mostly in marketing. 
What uh, was your position with Crane? Did you well, have various Well, I, I held positions? a lot of positions from product management up through, uh, I was their corporate applications engineering manager for about 10 years, which is very broadband experience. I was their director of integrated systems. I was their director of building energy conservation systems. I was, the last position I held was as the director of market development and new, all new product planning for the, for the corporation. Uh, just before I retired, I held that position, I think, for about five years. It was extremely interesting in terms of the long-range plan planning of the company. When I came with them, they were doing $40 million. When I left, they were doing $4 billion. Wow, well, you saw a, a lot of company. growth. growth yes. Yeah. What, what would you consider the milestones while you were with Train? Well, uh, probably, uh, it's hard to summarize in one thing. It's, it's probably several things. I, I did a lot of the work uh, that were resulted in what we called capsulized ratings on systems. I uh, used to be able to have to plot all the curves of evaporators and condensers and compressors, and it took forever to select a piece of equipment. And so we did all that and then put it into capsulized ratings so that you could select a piece of equipment in 30 seconds, which uh, greatly aided to the sale of the equipment, and we ended up doubling and doubling and doubling the volume of sales because of it, because it was easy to use. Uh, I did a lot of work in the field of uh, energy analysis. I uh, was one of the original inventors of the TRACE program, an energy analysis program. The TRACE program. For Can buildings. you explain that to me? Well, it allows you to do a by-zone, by-hour analysis on a building over a period of one year to determine how much energy it will use and where that energy will be used within the building between the various segments of, of equipment that use energy. So it has a load phase. It calculates the loads on the buildings. It simulates the systems and how they operate and react to the loads. It simulates the full and part load performance of the equipment. It uses a weather tape for weather year that that building sees. And in the end, it tells you how much energy that building uses before you ever build it. So that, it's quite an impressive thing. It does it about uh, four like, million calculations in about six minutes. It sounds like that <laughs> made a big impact on yeah. the industry. And then. So I was one of the inventors of that. And uh, then I also was responsible in the company for our first uh, integrated system work, where, which was micro-based electronics on control, building automation, uh, knitting the system together into an integrated system which is the thing today that's going on very strongly in the industry. It's, there's usually uh, strong. I was also one of the people in the company that got us involved and in was actually involved in the early startup of the BACnet program, which has resulted in a standard now, a standard communication protocol, a standard 135P, which is, I think, destined to become an international standard for allowing various manufacturers uh, automation equipment to communicate with each other. It fits right in with the yeah. World Wide Web. And oh yes, all very this much so. New yeah. computer yeah. technology. Yep, information age. How did you get into ASHRAE? By accident. <laughs> Actually, the reason I joined ASHRAE was kind of in a defensive mode. What year was that? Uh, 1970, I believe it was, right in that area. Uh, I joined ASHRAE through energy analysis work. Uh, Technical Committee 4.7, which is the one on energy calculations, on how you calculate energy use in buildings. And uh, at that time, they were not willing to accept the type of weather reduction that we were using within our computer programs. Uh, and so I joined ASHRAE and got involved in that committee to try to get those people to understand that any weather you use is an estimation because no two weather years are alike. And any way you condense that weather, as long as it represents a year of weather, is satisfactory. Well, uh, in that light, I got to know some very, very talented people. The energy gurus of the world at that time, uh, the Ross Merriweathers of the world, and, and Gene Stamper at New Jersey Institute of Technology, very influential in my career in ASHRAE. Uh, and through those folks, uh, and uh, the chairman at that time of the 9075 standard, building energy conservation existence, or in new building construction, a fellow named Jack Tumulty. Maybe some people will remember Jack. He's still around. But he was the chairman of the first standard 90. And I befriended Jack, and we got deeply involved in the writing of the standard 90 program 
on that standard, which was really, I think, what really put ASHRAE on the map internationally. Was that the study of what was the? That's the it's the energy conservation in existing buildings. I see. New building construction, not not existing. I'm sorry, new building construction. Uh, and that kind of put ASHRAE on the map you know, on an international level because until that time ASHRAE was going along and yes they were writing standards but uh, the only standards of real note were the standard 15 mechanical code standards things like that that really were recognized on an international level and so 9075 was a breakthrough for ASHRAE and thank God we seized the opportunity because if we hadn't somebody else would have and it brought ASHRAE to the forefront in terms of you know, prestige in the energy field. Well, along came the Arab embargo, oil embargo in 1975. We were lucky because we were working on this standard in 1973. And it came to pass, wouldn't you know, in 1975 when the embargo hit. And so the federal government picked it up, made it a national energy standard. And in doing so, uh, gave us a great deal of support. And that's since now been propagated into subsequent versions, the 90A-1980, 90.1 isn't now what the standard is called, dash 1989. I'm sure there will be further versions. I also then, uh, through my relationship with that particular committee, chaired the first existing building standard on industrial buildings for energy conservation in, in existing industrial buildings, which is a very big market. Today, it's 60% of the building market. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So we put out that very first standard also for the society. So I cut my teeth in ASHRAE in the standards area and the technical committee area. Came up Did that way. you belong to your local chapter? What chapter would that be? Oh, yes, I was a, a charter member. Of, of which it, chapter? Of the La Crosse chapter. And that's in which region? La Crosse, region? Wisconsin, in, in region, region 6. In region 6, right. Yeah, we didn't have a chapter, and the closest one was in Minneapolis or in Madison, Wisconsin, or Milwaukee. Did you get started in one of those and then... They we opened, built our own chapter. You built your own chapter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what year did that? That was in 1971. So, 1971, they started. And I was then the president of that chapter in 1972. Oh, so you've really been a leader in ASHRAE right from the beginning? Well, I started out pretty high on the ranks yeah. in, in the chapter level. I was, you know, uh, the president the second year the chapter existed. Uh -huh. And uh, the first year, the reason I wasn't is we wanted a consulting engineer to be the president, the first president of our chapter there locally. Uh, because we felt that uh, ASHRAE was a very strong engineering society and we wanted a consulting engineer involved in the formation of the chapter. How many members did that Oh, we started out with about have. 60. I think we have 200 now, something like that. Are you still going to your chapter? Well, not Not the there. Uh, no, I, since I've moved now to Cincinnati, I've transferred my allegiance to the Cincinnati chapter, which is also a very large chapter, 400 and some people. And it's in Region 5. Region 5. Yeah. Do you enjoy going to those meetings then? Well, or are you active I there? haven't... Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to go yet. I've joined the chapter, though, and I'm going to go. It's just that it's so far compared to La Crosse. I could uh, drive two miles and be in a chapter meeting. Now I have to drive 40. No, that is <laughs> and I'm not that familiar with Cincinnati yet. We just moved there. So I'm a little hesitant toward going into the bowels of the city when I don't really know where I'm going to go to a chapter meeting. But I'll get there. Well, they'll be, they'll be thrilled to have you oh, as a member. Uh, they've been very, very kind. Uh, they've sent me all the books on their chapter and the history of their chapter. And they're, they're a very, very, very progressive chapter. I'm happy to be, be a member of it. So you were always attending the uh, society meetings since you were a Oh, yes, since about 1970, uh, 69, something like that. And I've you... talked at a lot of ASHRAE chapters before I ever became a member, believe it or not. Because of your affiliation, just with, with the, my affiliation uh, with the train company, HVAC yeah. Yeah. industry. Yeah, so. I had spoken to many, many of the chapters before I ever joined. Mm -hmm. So it was a very. I don't believe in joining things unless you're going to participate. It was a very easy move for you to make then to oh, join yes, yeah. I knew people in the society before I joined it. Now we're going to get up to the year that you were president. Okay. That wasn't okay. too long ago. It was. Okay. It was pre. It was just before the centennial year, but you yes. were very much involved in the centennial planning. In the build-up for it, yes. yes. Yeah. 1993-94. Yes, that's correct, 93-94. You've got good memory. <laughs> yes, I can remember back several years. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a, kind of a fun year because we were building up to the centennial. Everything was in preparation. The centennial committees were formed, you know, and, and, and uh, solidified. and. Uh, and a lot of very good people were involved in this, a lot of very hard work, 
uh, it was a lot of fun. It wasn't my main thought, though, in, in terms of my presidential year. I had some other priorities beyond the centennial because the centennial year was uh, President Billy Manning's year, and all I could do is to help prepare for it so that it, you know, was on a very good, solid, solid foundation when Bill got involved, and he got involved early and did just an outstanding job that year, really an outstanding job. I was very proud of him. We had a lot of fun, he, he and I, together, being uh, president and president-elect. Uh, you learn a lot. What was your theme for your presidential year? Uh, my theme was uh, aimed primarily at young people. Uh, it was called Ashray, the Bridge to Professional Growth. And uh, I had very strong feelings. It was a real good feeling to me to be able to work with young people and get them involved. I've always been that way. I've mentored a lot of young people in our company, three or four vice presidents and many, many more. Uh, and so I enjoy working with young people, and that's where I had probably the most fun in my presidential year, getting out to the universities. Uh, I visited several, uh, working with the young people, the enthusiasm, and uh, growing the society in terms of new, younger members, because we're aging quite rapidly, just as the country is. And uh, if we aren't careful, we're going to find ourselves without good leadership in the future. And my whole idea was to try to build some of that leadership among the young, young people coming up today and getting them involved, because our age is averaging up each year in the society. And uh, so it was fun doing that. Did you uh, accomplish any pro did any committees or programs start as a result of this uh, theme? New programs. Uh, we did a lot of work on, on in the standards area. We did uh, quite a bit of work on membership in the membership program. We had for, I think, one of the first times a formal membership growth program that was very, very intense. And uh, as a result, we had phenomenal success in terms of young people getting them involved, the student chapters, uh, whatever, the membership, which was very gratifying to me. And uh, as a result of all this work, I think uh, at the end of the year, we ended up, uh, which is very unusual, with a net gain in overall membership when other societies were actually decreasing. So I was very proud of that. It was very hard work, and a lot of the chapters and regions really went out there and did it. And I was very proud. I spent a lot of time kind of pepping them up, <laughs> going out to our, our chapters around the country here. It seems to me, as I observe the people at the show today, yeah. there's a lot of young people walking around. They're here. getting there, and that's, that's, that's very encouraging. You don't know that's, uh, how encouraging that is, because we went for quite a while without that. And I didn't want Ash Ray to become a good old boys club. So you feel like this was maybe one of your significant accomplishments during I your I got a lot of young president. people into the society. I got a lot of new people new... into the society. It'll take a while before that effect is felt, That's I right. suppose. Because... I even got my own president of my company to join the society. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and our executive vice presidents and our vice president of engineering and all these people I got into the society. One, you asked me about accomplishments, mm -hmm. things like that. One of the things that I'm very proud of is the fact that I got my company to commit to the tune of $75,000 a year for a series of about eight years to form scholarships, full four-year scholarships for engineering students from the interest off of that investment, something to the tune of $300,000. Well, that and that started really a lot of the basic work that started up the foundation that we now have. Damon uh, was very kind. Uh, in, in uh, recognizing that fact. That was one of the funniest things that really happened to me. Can you tell us more about that? Well, we were down, I think, uh, we were having an executive committee meeting. We had a lot of fun, by the way, in executive committee meetings, but we were down in, I think it was Hilton Head. We met down there because we got good prices. <laughs> and not, it wasn't the fact that it's a very nice place, but we really got some good bargains down there. But, Anyway, we were down there, and Damon Gowan happened to be president at the time, and Damon's been very influential in the foundation, as you know. And uh, Damon was in the bathroom. He was half-dressed. We were over in his uh, particular room with uh, Damon and Carolyn. And uh, he was in the bathroom, and I said, Damon, I want you to come and answer the phone. He came out, and he's, you know, mm -hmm. 
And uh, he picked up the phone, and uh, I'm the executive vice president of the train company was on the phone. And he said, Damon, he said, I'm going to donate $75,000 to the train company, and I want you to know it's because of you. <laughs> and Damon about fell off, you know, the end of the cliff. And he said, can I tell the rest of the guys? He's <laughs> It's funny, but it's and uh, it really impressed him, and, and uh, that charged his batteries in terms of that foundation really heavily. And he's been, as you know, very successful, and and with a group of very uh, uh, dedicated industry individuals as well. Among those are Tom McLee and the train company too. And Carrier has uh, one of their officers on that trustees group. Uh, they're just some very very good people. And that's an important foundation uh, well, to get started. That's to subsidize the operation of the society in a lot of areas, particularly education, but a lot of other programs as well. So that's, that's I think, a major accomplishment and one that will be lasting. I think uh, at this meeting we had a contribution of $1 million from one individual. Yes, that was quite startling to the membership to hear about that. I think some draw jaws dropped. Yes. yes. <laughs> but this is the real thing. And uh, the goal is far from over. It's just getting started. Now, do you want to tell us, since we bro brought up the subject about the million dollars, who was it that started Well, I'd be happy to. He's a good friend. That. He's a presidential member. Presidential member? It's Fred Colas from Hawaii. Fred Colas. Fred is a very dedicated ASHRAE individual, let me tell you. He was very influential in my life in bringing me up in the ASHRAE circles as were several other presidential members, uh, like Lou Flagg. Damon was very influential, Damon Gowan. And he was kind of my, I guess, my idol or my mentor, he and Lou. But Bill Collins, very helpful. Bill was the guy that interviewed me to ask me if I wanted or wanted or was interested at all in serving at a higher level in ASHRAE. Beyond the technical Beyond, committees? Beyond uh, uh, being a vice president. Vice President, is that your first My first job, to uh, the... my, I, didn't, I really haven't gone into that for you if you're interested. I would I, like uh, to hear more. After chairing a lot of standards, I became standard, standard chairman, standards committee chairman for the society on all standards. And then I served on the technology council from that. And I've served really on all four, five councils of the society, including regions council. I've chaired three, four of them and uh, served on the fifth one as a vice chairman. Uh, so they kind of spread you around and groom you so that you have a very good intimate feel for the committees and the councils of a society. Very important if you're going to be effective at all. And also I think it's good to have grassroots experience, which I had. So it was very, uh, it was very surprising that I ever rose to the level of presence. I didn't try to do it at all. I had no real strong aspirations. Uh, it's the true the office seeks the person, I think. And that was the case in my case. They asked me if I would do it. And I said, oh, you know, one year of your life. It is a year of your life. Yes, I, I imagine you and Liz had quite a year oh, yes. as your presidential year. Yeah. How many places Somewhere did you Somewhere between visit? fear and panic most of the time. <laughs> but uh, we, we, uh, we didn't travel abroad too much, You didn't really. go abroad? We went to England uh, for the joint SIBSI meetings and things like that. Those are obligatory for the most part. We spent a little time in Mexico. We spent some time in Puerto Rico. Uh, spent quite a bit of time in Canada. But most of our membership in the societies, you probably well know, Pat, are, are, are within the United States and Canada. Probably 90% of our total membership. And so I kind of made a conscious decision that I wanted to serve that 90% more effectively than trying to spread myself like peanut butter all over the world. Uh, because God knows we, we have people that have, have pretty much traveled around the world promoting Ashway. I didn't think it was necessary to do it every year. And I thought I'd be more effective trying to do it within the continental United States and Canada. And, and Mexico and San Juan were pretty close by. And you do that by going to the CRCs? Oh, by CRCs and chapters. Chapter, chapters. Regular chapter visits. Yeah. yeah, you spend quite a bit of time also uh, nurturing relations with various associate societies. I. Uh, Spent quite a bit of time with SMACNA, Sheet Metal Contractors Association. I spent a lot of time with the lighting people, IES. I was mending fences in this case. We've, we've had uh, various conflicts from time to time. 
some personal, some others, you know, in, 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 in general philosophies. But they were involved in writing part of our standard, you know, the 90 standard, which is a big standard for ASHRAE. It's good to cooperate. And so I wanted to try to soften up that relationship and get it on a good even keel, and it did come about very nicely. And uh, they're very cooperative now, and that's, uh, that was fun. That was kind of the peacemaker role a little bit. Um, but uh, there are a lot of other societies, too, that we, we have just a whole lot of associate societies around the country and world. And I was always amazed at how well we were received by them. Every place you go, ASHRAE is way up here. You know, you get a seat at the front table. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened at, in, in our executive committee meetings. That's kind of funny. Yes, do share that with us. I look at that as probably the most fun. That and chapter meetings and regional meetings, where you get out and really get to meet the people. But uh, we had a lot of fun in our particular XCOM because uh, we had a great rivalry going between the senior and the junior officers. The senior officers actually thought they ran the executive committee, but they didn't. See, we had them outnumbered. <laughs> and Damon was kind of a control guy, a very strong-willed individual, very ethical, very, very nice man. But uh, one day we passed a, a motion so fast that he couldn't figure out what happened that gave us all the power. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did Damon's that Damon's mouth just dropped open. He didn't know what to say. He, he didn't know if we were kidding. <laughs> we were. One person made the motion. Oh, yeah. Somebody other one seconded, seconded it. And then the other one said, I call for, you know, cease. Stuff, anything goes. And we, we passed the motion. All in favor, I. Four out of seven voted yes. And Damon was off, uh, uh, you know, out of control. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with that. We were always playing jokes on each other, kidding each other. We played a lot of golf together and stuff like that. So we had lots of fun as, a, as an ex-count. That was joyful. And when you got together with the board in general, were there any amusing Oh, moments? gosh. There are always amusing things. I remember we passed a regulation that somebody had to cut his beard, but he never would. <laughs> it remember? didn't work. No, it didn't work. He's <laughs> still there, work. and he's still wearing, wearing his beard. We had all kinds of little things. I'd always try to have a little fun while you're at it. You get the most done. I think it makes, it makes the time better for everyone. I've always thought that a little humor diffuses tension also when you get into some really tight situations. You know, we've had several over the years where uh, very tough decisions. Was that uh, while you were president or while you were working your well, way we to Well, we had, the you, you get into councils. a lot of these while you're president. While you're president. Uh, things that are... Uh, what were the hot buttons while you were president? Well, always is, uh, energy is always hot. It will be for a long time because we're burning up, you know, non-renewable resources. So uh, we better do something about that and continue to do something about it. We are doing something about it. We're leading in that area. Uh, other areas, uh, very strong, uh, were the CFC issue. Billy got involved in that. Billy Manning got involved in that quite heavily in the code side of it. Uh, we were writing new standards, Standard 15, which is a, a standard on mechanical rooms, safety in mechanical rooms. We were writing a Standard 34 on classification of uh, new refrigerants uh, in terms of their toxicity and their, you know, their volatility and flammability and, and suitability from the standpoint of depleting the ozone layer. And this was all during your presidential It was started year? out in that area. Started and it finished, out. I think, during Bill's presidency. But nothing happens that fast. Uh, ASHRAE is a big flywheel. You learn that very quickly. That you may have great ideas, but you probably won't finish half of what you start. It, if it's good, it will get finished. If it isn't, it may be dropped. So obviously you try to do good things that will carry through. Uh, We've had very good luck with standards 15 and 34. They're in all the major codes now, building codes. ASHRAE is the basis of code. So you can see we're building continually our relationships uh, with the code bodies and the building industry in general, the world for that matter. Uh, we have the secretariat on many international standards right now, which is a very powerful position. And ultimately, we'll control what goes into those things. And that has a big factor in terms of international trade. If you can write the standards around your systems, your products, you have a big advantage internationally.
So you would say ASHRAE has definitely oh, been a right growth up there, of, right on the top, right now. Been a big I'm very factor in the growth of the of industry, it, frankly, because we've gone we've gone a long way, in my opinion, and due to some great people. And you can see in the future, ASHRAE being an important part of the oh, industry. Oh, they're a global leader. They will be for a long time. If they don't drop the ball, and we never will, I don't think, because we're growing all the time, technically. We're very heavy now into indoor air quality. We're the leader in that field in terms of standards. Standard 62, ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality, is a very, very important standard. It's a nationally recognized. It's internationally recognized right now. And it's going to be in the new building standards internationally. So you can see these things are really leadership roles. That's why we have the respect worldwide that we do. And we continually amaze people that how we can get so many people to volunteer to do all the work that we do. And they do. And they fight to get on these committees. And because people it's... People with great education oh, yeah, and, yeah. and They're taking career time experience. out of very, very busy schedules. And um, yeah, the untold hours that are donated to this society uh, you know, would dwarf our budget. Well, it's easy to see why you fit in with all these other uh, people that are people, yeah. just as qualified as you. I'm just you. one of the one of the many. Believe me, it's really fun. You're one of the leaders of the many. Well, I was I was sure. I was lucky to become that. Really. What other um, interests and hobbies do you have besides Ashray? Oh, I golly. heard you mention golf. Yeah, I like to play golf. I. Not very good, but I like to play. I spend a lot of time with my grandson now. You have a grandson? Oh, sure. He's, how old did you say he's your 13. grandson? He's 13. He's a sports nut. Is he going to be an engineer? Oh, yeah. He's a straight-A student in math and science right now. He's uh, got perfect report cards for the last three years. He gets a, uh, it costs me an arm and leg every time he gets one, but I mean, you know. He's a good kid. He's, gonna, he's going to be in science, I know. Uh, probably he's going to end up going to his dad's university, which is University of Wisconsin. University. Uh, he talks like he wants to go to, you know, MIT, but I don't think he'll make it. <laughs> it's a little bit of money there. His dad won't put up with it, but uh, he's a good kid. So he's, he's my joy right now as far as, you know, spending my retirement years. Yes, your retirement years. How long have you been retired? Since August of 94. I'm kind of getting the hang of it now. <laughs> what, what changes have you made in your life since you retired? Well. I'm still working. You uh, still working? Oh yes, I don't ever want to totally retire. Uh, I'm still, I'm writing a book right now, I'm consulting with a company, and I'm rewriting their air conditioning manual, which uh, covers the broad subject of air conditioning. And then when I get done with that, they tell me they have another book they want me to write. So it's one of these things where you can work as much as you can work and, you know, without losing it all. And so I'm doing that. and, and uh, I stay pretty busy, really. That would yeah, keep you yeah. busy, and then that helps Ashray too, because oh, yeah, you're still yeah. going to be involved with Ashray. Yeah, what I'll tell you, you once, once Ashray you now? become president, they don't let go of you very easy. They don't. They know a good <laughs> thing. They're not going to let go no, of it. I was chair of the nominating committee this year for our officers and, and directors, and also the vice chairman of the long range planning committee for the society. I also chaired a steering committee on a, a total building design conference that we put on. Uh, in Chicago about three months ago, something like that, I think it was, uh, as a first. It's kind of plowing new ground, which I love to do. So I'll stay involved. I'll be involved for a few years yet anyway, and probably not as heavily as, as during the presidential year, of course, because that year was just a blur. You, you were on the road all the time. I think I counted up, I spent 150 days a year in an airplane. That takes, a lot, of, that takes a, lot of a lot of time and energy. Yeah, it does. It's hard for uh, it's hard for your wife too. She she does a lot of work too. Most people don't give their wives enough credit in that area because she has to preside at functions. She has to attend functions with you, uh, where she doesn't know a soul. Sometimes it's very hard. So uh, a lot of credit goes to her too, you know. And uh, she looks back on it with a lot of uh, I think joy, whether she admits it or not. It's, uh, as I say, during uh, the year, it was half fear and half panic <laughs> because she really hadn't been used to seeing crowds of a thousand people at a time, you know, things like that, or having to host large receptions and things like that. So it's hard. 
hard and work for She did for a fine lady. job. I know yeah. Liz, and I enjoy yeah, visiting she's just, with Liz. She's just down to earth people. She likes she's to. She's very that. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And your children are wonderful too. Oh yeah, they're great kids. I've been blessed. You mentioned that earlier, before the interview, that you had made a health change. Would you like to? Oh, the hardest thing I ever did. Tell people about that. Well, what I'm doing is improving the indoor air quality. I stopped smoking <laughs> for about a year and a half now. Um, and that's one of the harder things you've done. Oh, it's very hard. Anybody that says Personal that, accomplishment. Uh, it's easy is smoking rope. It's very difficult, you know. I'm glad to hear it. But, uh, you're looking very healthy. Yes, I am looking very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Putting on weight. You enjoy food more. Do you have any other comments that you'd like to make before closing remarks? You know, I guess the one thing that I was impressed about in Ashray is the fact that the society is really people. It's a people business. And uh, if you didn't enjoy people, you wouldn't enjoy the society at all because there's a great deal of camaraderie. It's like a family. I think, as I mentioned in my inaugural area of the a speech in there that, that, that I had two families. I felt like I really did. One was my own family and one was my ASHRAE family. And I spent uh, much more time with my ASHRAE family that particular year, but nevertheless, it is a family and, and people stick together and they work together and I'm just amazed at the camaraderie that comes about because of it. So that's one impression I have of the society that I don't think we'll ever erase. The other one is the fact that we have a very dedicated staff God bless them because they really are dedicated and they really give you a lot of help during a time when you're really running. From writing your speeches to various groups to you know, arranging your travel to doing all kinds of things for you that frankly you'd never have time to do. At least do it right. And everything seems to turn out pretty rosy in spite of whatever the president does to screw it up. You know, uh, The philosophy is uh, give the direction, get the hell out of the way and let them get the job done. And that's what we like to do. And uh, we had a good year, I thought. From a membership standpoint, outstanding year. Financially, outstanding year. We had uh, uh, came through the year uh, very much under budget. The society had a very good growth year financially so that we can use that money in good ways, to, you know, further programs and scholarships and things like that. I tried to set an example fiscally for the other officers. Lou Flagg and I, he taught me that. <laughs> to spend the money like it's yours and you'll be a little more careful with it. And so we, I think, did a lot in that regard to, to, to set a standard, which is, uh, it's, you know, it's what we ought to do. Get the most for the dollar. So it's been a fun year. I wouldn't give it up for the world. And I look back on it with fond memories for a long time. Well, we appreciate your taking the time today to come and be interviewed and share your thoughts and experiences with us. Yeah, I'm happy to do it, Pat, especially well, with you. Well, thank you very much. Okay. We've been talking with Mr. Neil Patterson, Presidential Member, 1993-94. I hope you've enjoyed listening to Mr. Patterson as much as I've enjoyed talking with him.